Hello, everyone! Welcome to episode number 602 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. This week's podcast is all about data security and robotic decision making. First up, Parander Das, CEO and co-founder of Sotero, joins me to discuss Sotero's all-in-one data security platform, the issues surrounding cloud data security today, and the benefits of Sotero's ransomware solution. Also this week, I check out a new method developed by a team of researchers at MIT that could give robots the ability to make intuitive, task-relevant decisions. But before all of that robot business, let's talk about data security with Parander Das from Sotero. Hello, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so first off, for my audience who may not know, what is Sotero all about? We are a data security company in the broader cybersecurity space. We approach data protection or data security with a unique twist. We are focused on helping companies secure and protect and live up to their commitments to their customers from a privacy and security perspective by enabling them to apply controls and protections at the data level. Typically, you'll hear about security measures at the periphery or the the perimeter or the network. We enable true data protection at the data level. So let's start off talking about Sotero's data security platform. Tell me more about this all-in-one data security platform. Yeah. Historically, uh, data protection consists of multiple products, right? Because there isn't a single product that can protect data in all of its forms. And if you think about it, an organization has data that's structured, unstructured, and semi-structured, meaning they have data in databases, they have data in big data stores, which is typically semi-structured, and they have a huge amount of data in files. There isn't a product out there that provides protection for data in all of its forms. And then you complicate this because data exists on premise, in the cloud, in various different technology platforms. In our perspective, true data protection consists of a few different things. One is ensuring that data stays protected while it's being used. That's where our innovative approach comes in and our ability to query data in its encrypted state. The second is enabling access right at the data level making sure that the right people with the right privileges are the ones accessing and viewing the data. The third aspect of that is threat detection and prevention. I mean, everybody's heard about the ransomware attacks and the data losses and the breaches on a daily basis. We actually utilize machine learning algorithms to look at data access or requests in real time and are able to identify a multitude of threats that range from unauthorized access attempts all the way down to uh, ransomware or malware attacks on data. The final piece of this is data discovery and classification. You can't protect data if you don't know where the sensitive data assets are stored. So our platform enables everything from data discovery, classification, to data protection and real-time threat detection and prevention. Okay, so cloud data security is a huge issue these days. So what do you think are the biggest challenges in this arena? There are probably two big mistakes that companies make. One is they tend to believe that what they've done on premise is going to transport over to the cloud. And that doesn't, right? Because you don't have control. The architecture is different, et cetera, et cetera. So once they realize that the second big mistake they make is, well, the cloud provider tells me that they have security. So that should be enough because we're paying the money. That's a big fallacy. The cloud providers definitely provide some level of security, but it doesn't keep your data protected or make it secure. Organizations need to look at cloud data protection much more granularly and enable products or technologies that put them in control of their own privacy and security. So how does Sotero help solve these issues? And what kind of benefits are we looking at when it comes to Sotero's cloud data security solution? 
the first thing is like the technologies in the cloud are very different, right? I mean, they're not the same technologies typically that you use in an on-premise situation. Sotero helps by providing the capability to protect data in pretty much any of the data storage platforms that a cloud provider provides or that a company uses. So that becomes seamless. You have a really easy but effective way to protect data in any form that is stored in the cloud. Second is the simplicity, right? You don't have to train your people to learn a new product, a platform, or a technology. Our product is seamless, extremely easy to use integrates with all of the applications that a company's users use to analyze, process, and access data in the cloud. So I was also really interested in your ransomware solution. So tell me more about that. We have a very different approach to ransomware detection and and protection, right? When you hear a ransomware protection products, they're typically endpoint or laptop in a very simplistic perspective based agents that look at activity or behavior at the end point. They're mostly signature-based, meaning that somebody else has done the research to say, hey, this is a ransomware strain and here's how it behaves. So they're essentially looking for fingerprints or signatures. That only protects you for so long because in a zero-day attack, you don't have the signature to fall back on. We take a different approach in saying, what are these attackers after? They're not after the encrypting or disrupting the laptop. They're actually after the organization's data or information. So we look at what's happening on the data or data storage platform, which is essentially stores all the information. Our model, our process is able to detect a ransomware attack as it develops by looking at what's happening at the data asset level. That could be a database, that could be a file store, it could be an object store. We look at the activity pattern on that in real time and are able to identify and isolate a ransomware attack in less than two minutes. We use machine learning, advanced machine learning algorithms to identify the ransomware attack. Fantastic. All right, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. So if you could have one meal right now, doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, what would you have? Uh, Would probably be cacio e pepe in uh, Italy. Nice, why that dish? I'm a huge fan of pasta, and there's nothing more simple but elegant as a cacio e pepe. Simplest ingredients, but the the result is outstanding. I love it. What a good choice. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Have you heard about Clio, the new program developed at MIT that can help robots quickly map a scene and then identify the items they need to complete a given task? Okay, this is super cool. So, this new approach, which was named after the Greek muse of history, helps robots make intuitive, task-relevant decisions by enabling a robot to survey an area and identify the parts of the scene that matter all based on the tasks at hand. With this program, a robot can take in a list of tasks, which are described in natural language, and then based on those tasks, determine the level of granularity required to interpret its surroundings. And then from there, remember what parts of the area are important. Okay, so why is this new research so important? Well, let's step back a bit and talk about closed set versus open set fields. There has been a lot of research in this robot object identification for a while now. There has been huge advances in areas of computer science and natural language processing that have allowed robots to better distinguish objects in their surroundings. Until recently, robots were only able to identify objects in closed set scenarios, where the area around them was controlled and carefully curated, with a specific number of objects that the robot was pre-trained to recognize. But more recently, there has been a movement toward open set recognition, where robots can discern objects in more realistic environments. 
Here, researchers have used deep learning tools to build neural networks that can process billions of images from the internet, along with an image's associated text. And from there, the robot applies that neural network to identify a specific object in a new area. But there's a challenge here. How do you parse a scene to make sure that it's relevant for a particular task? Dominic Maggio, a member of the MIT Lincoln Laboratory who worked on this Clio project, explains the challenge like this. Typical methods will pick some arbitrary, fixed level of granularity for determining how to fuse segments of a scene into what they can consider as one object. However, the granularity of what you call an object is actually related to what the robot has to do. If that granularity is fixed without considering the tasks, then the robot may end up with a map that isn't useful for its tasks. But with Clio, this team from MIT sought to fix this issue by aiming to enable robots to interpret their surroundings with a level of granularity that can be automatically tuned to the tasks at hand. Okay, think of it like this. You want a robot to retrieve a green book from a stack of books. With Clio, it would determine that the green book was a single target object and ignore the rest of the scene, including the rest of the stack of books. But if the task was to move the whole stack of books, it would consider that whole stack as the task relevant object. So along with computer vision and language models that use neural networks to connect millions of images and semantic text, Clio also utilizes mapping tools that actually split up an image into a lot of little segments, which are then fed into the neural network to see if certain segments are semantically similar. From there, Clio also compresses a number of image segments specifically to identify and store segments that are semantically most relevant to a given task. So, how did these MIT researchers test out Clio? Well, they did a whole lot of fun experiments. In a cluttered cubicle on the MIT campus, they used Clio to automatically segment a scene at different levels of granularity based on a set of tasks determined in natural language prompts, such as get the first aid kit or move the rack of magazines. They used Clio in real time with Boston Dynamics quadruped robot Spot. Spot was able to identify and map only the parts of the office building that were part of its tasks, which included retrieving a dog toy and not messing with the piles of office supplies. And get this, they also used Clio in Dominic Maggio's apartment as well, where Maggio points out where I didn't do any cleaning beforehand. <laughs> so first, this team put together a series of natural language tasks, like move the pile of clothes, and then applied Clio to images of Maggio's cluttered apartment. In these cases, they found that Clio was able to segment the various areas of the apartment and then feed those segments through the algorithm to identify which segments made up the pile of clothes. So the motivation behind the development of Clio was to clean up messy MIT apartments? <laughs> no, it was actually search and rescue and also factory floor robots that work alongside humans. Luca Carlone, the director of the MIT Spark Laboratory, explains it like this. 
It's really about helping the robot understand the environment and what it has to remember in order to carry out its mission. Wow. So where is Clio headed from here? First, the team from MIT plans to adapt Clio to be able to handle higher level tasks and also to build upon recent advancements in photorealistic visual scene representations. Maggio maps out the future of Clio like this. We're still giving Clio tasks that are somewhat specific, like find the deck of cards. For search and rescue, we need to give it more high-level tasks, like find survivors or get power back on. So we need to get to a more human-level understanding of how to accomplish more complex tasks. Super cool, right? So if you want even more information about Clio to read the associated research paper called Clio Real-Time Task-Driven Open Set 3D Scene Graphs, or even more information about Sotero, I've included several links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Well, hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing... I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And folks, we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. It is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series, hosted by me, and our brand new animated series called Libby's Lab. And, of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of October 4th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.